the Christmas spirit because it's the hope and the message of Christmas that helps you to stay together when life is falling apart. It's the story of Christmas when it seems that life is unraveling that gives us the hope that things will turn around and things will be better. It's the depth of meaning of Christmas that keeps our lives from being all torn up and messed up when stuff is going on around us. The amazing awesomeness of Christmas has nothing to do with the season, but everything to do with the Savior. It's the power and the person behind Christmas that meets us when we're bruised and broken. It meets us when we're battered and burdened. It meets us when we're bewildered and don't know really what to do. Christ meets us in those moments. It's the message and the hope of Christmas that keeps you anchored and stabled when things are unstable, shaky, and crumbling all around us. The world spends a lot of time preparing for an observance, but Christmas is more than an observance. It's an experience. And it's an experience of knowing that Christ was born in Bethlehem has come to be born in you and me and now lives and abide in you and in me. And so for the believer, the church, all the Christmas presents in the world don't mean nothing to us without the presence of Christ. There are multiple meaningful definitions about Christmas, but I want to use this definition. Christmas is is doing a little bit extra for somebody else. Isn't that what you do every year? You go in debt, you buy a bunch of stuff to pass out gifts to friends and to family. Don't you do it every year? For a long time, we would stop and pause and make sure at Christmas that there was a little bit extra under the tree because we wanted our children to have put a smile on their face and bring joy to them and give them some things that they needed. So in this Christmas season, didn't God do something unusual and unique? Didn't he put something a little bit extra in the world for us to partake of? A little bit something extra for us to have? If you don't remember it, he went and the angels came and spoke to the shepherds who were in the field by night. They were considered to be the lowest of the low, the bottom of the barrel. They were not considered to be those that other people wanted to have anything to do with. But the angel comes to them to bring them the story that the Christ, the king, was being born in Bethlehem. And it went a little bit like this. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. That's the greatest gift that anybody could want or anybody could have. For unto you, unto you, the lowest of the low, those who are the outcasts, those who are cast aside, those who are looked down by on by society. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in the manger. God came and delivered on his promise that he had made back in Isaiah when he told Isaiah for unto us a child is born unto us a king shall be born God delivered on his promise that he made back in Genesis when he told Adam and Eve that he would send 
a savior into the world. That's exactly what God did. He gave a little bit extra. He had given us a world in creation. He had given life to Adam and Eve. He had created a garden in Eden so that we would have a place to live and abide. He had given Israel a name to be his people, kings to rule them, prophets to teach them, guide them. God had given a little bit extra. God went beyond what he had already done. He gave us an event in time in history that we call Christmas. He did something extra. He did more than he had done. He gave more than he had ever given and we call that day Christmas. Christmas is doing a little extra for someone and our text again today declares that Christ is the greatest gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. It's a universal gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It wasn't a gift just for Mary and Joseph. It wasn't a gift for a certain segment of society. It wasn't just for Jerusalem and Galilee and Bethlehem. It was a universal gift. So while I'm preaching and you're teaching here in Tyler, somebody else on the other side of the world is preaching and teaching about Jesus because the word of Jesus reaches wherever you are. If someone would lift up the name of Jesus, he said that he would draw all men unto him. Listen, you're not here today because you live the model life. You're not here to today because you've lived and demonstrated a flawless lifestyle. You're here because God loved you enough to spare you and let you have another day. And wherever you are and whatever situation you found yourself in when you met Jesus, you met him when you were down. You met him when you were hurt. You met him when you were confused. You met him when you were sin's best buddy. But God's had mercy on you and God looked beyond all your faults and saw your needs. There's a story told of Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time. Spurgeon was walking across the countryside with one of his buddies and they were walking and looking and talking and they looked up and they saw a weather vane and the weather vane said God is love. Spurgeon remarked to his companion that he thought this was a rather inappropriate place for such a message because weather vanes are changeable. He said, but God's love is constant. His friend said, I don't agree with you about those words. You misunderstood the meaning. That sign is indicating a wonderful truth. Regardless of which way the wind blows, God is love. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter the ups or the downs, no matter the chaos or the confusion, God's love is still on the throne. God is still loving you in all of the ups and downs of life, in all of the choices that we've made to go against God's will, in all of our choices to do things our way, in all of our choices to mark out and leave out parts of the Bible in our daily walk instead of turning the other cheek we want to knock them down instead of doing the things that God has directed for us to do we want to do it our way and let them know and let them have a piece of our mind but God's love will come to where you are and reach you where you are you cannot be blown away by anything that happens this love of God is found in the blood that Jesus shed out on Calvary. A songwriter wrote about this concept of the blood of Christ and its global reach when he said it reaches 
to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. The love of God will reach you. Your life is not beyond his reach. Your situation is not beyond his reach. Your struggle is not beyond his reach. Where you are and where you drifted to is not beyond his reach. It's a gift that redeems. It just does not reach. It can do something about your condition. That word redeem literally means to buy you back. The love of God bought you back. Don't you remember the story of Hosea and Gomer? In the book of Hosea, in the first 12 books of the prophets of the Old Testament, God told Hosea to marry Gomer, a prostitute. Hosea did as God asked and married Gomer. Gomer continued to go with other men, but Hosea stayed true to her. Gomer continued to be unfaithful even after she had had Hosea's children, but God told Hosea to stay with her. Hosea went so far as even to pay a redemption price to buy his wife's back. What does this book of Hosea teach us? God turned Hosea's life and marriage into a living parable. The lesson from Hosea and Gomer includes God's eternal love for his people, even when they sin. God will never give up on us, just as Hosea didn't give up on God, on, on Gomer. God continues to love us, even when we've fallen short, even when we've messed up, even when we've turned our backs on him, God still loves us. Christ is the greatest gift because it's a, second of all, a gracious gift. He gave his only begotten son. He gave us the best that he had. He gave his all. He gave himself. God's gift was so priceless and so precious that it's almost hard for us to find the words to declare what it means to us. Paul attempted in 2 Corinthians 9 and 15 to tell us what the word meant to him. What Christ coming into the world, changing his life out on the Damascus road. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. That's what Paul said in the King James Version. In the ESV Version, it says, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. In the NIV, it says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. In the New Living Testimony, it says, Thank God for his gift, too wonderful for words. And what makes it unspeakable? What makes it inexpressible? What makes it so indescribable and too wonderful for words for us to speak? Well, I can't speak for you. I can only speak for me. I was walking in Houston down the bayou and the song came to my mind. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. I was very deeply stained within. I was sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea looked beyond all my faults and saw my needs. He looked at me and saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. He looked at me and saw that I was worthy of another chance. He looked at me in my sinfulness and said, I'll give you another assignment. He looked at me and asked me to do another thing. And it was given to me freely. I couldn't pay him if I tried. I don't have enough money to pay him back. There's not enough time in each day for me to pay him back if I tried from getting up early in the morning until working all through the day. I still couldn't pay him back. That's what makes it so gracious. The father gave his son at no cost to mankind. For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, but it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can brag. What is that gift? It's the gift of eternal life. 
It's the gift of God and it was given to anyone who wants to receive it. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, it would be given unto them. It is given faithfully that whosoever would believe. Whosoever is the drug addict on the corner. Whosoever is the thief who broke in our house. Whosoever is anybody who would accept him as their Lord and Savior. Third of all, Christ is the greatest gift because it's a guaranteed gift. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but they shall have everlasting life. And that's what makes the gift great. Time will not damage the gift. Christ came with a guarantee behind him, a guarantee upon him, and a guarantee with him. And the guarantee covers anybody and everybody. You may have an enemy that keeps getting on your nerve every day. You may have a neighbor that you feel is unworthy or unsuited. Or you may know somebody that you feel like they're the most evil person in the world. But even to them, God has promised to love them in where, wherever they are, however they are, and however they act. We have the guarantee that we will not be lost. We have the guarantee that the least of us can be saved. We have the guarantee that nobody will be left out. This guarantee covers our sins. Though your sins be as scarlet, he will make them as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. He will create a clean heart and renew a right spirit within you. It covered a woman caught in adultery, whosoever. It covered a disciple who denied him, whosoever. It covered a disciple who doubted him. It covered a thief on the cross. It covered a jailer in Philippi. It covered a tax collector named Zacchaeus. And it's all because God so loved the world that he gave. Christmas is about the love of God. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, of whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, but love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. I used to think that Jesus Loves Me was a little child song. It was a song designated and designed for children. But Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves the worst and the least of all. He is the greatest gift that God could give unto us. And we ought to submit to his will. We ought to love him enough to live for him. We ought to love him enough to witness for him. We ought to love him enough to show the world and allow for our lights to shine in this dark world. Don't you love him? Hadn't he been good to you? Hasn't he lifted your bowed down head? Hasn't he given you joy in the midst of sorrows? Hasn't he opened doors that no one could close? Hasn't he given you opportunity that no one else wanted you to have? He's a good God. He's a wonderful God. He's a great God. And we ought to serve him joyfully and peacefully. There may be one here this morning who doesn't know him in the pardon of their sins. Maybe somebody's been talking to you, trying to witness to you, and you've rejected the gift of the Savior. 
We offer to you our Savior. He's wonderful. He's marvelous. He's He's all the things that the Bible declares to us. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the prince of peace. He is the savior of the world. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. We've done as the Lord has commanded. There will always be room in our Father's kingdom. Prepare now to receive our tithes and offerings. 